Hello, everybody, and welcome to Killers, Kings, and Clowns, the Underworld podcast. I'm Paul Whitcomb. I'm with John William Tuey and Camillus Robinson. This is part two of an interview with a very knowledgeable man and a great, great oral storyteller. He, he just really draws you in to his knowledge of this world. And we're talking about the impact of his father's chosen profession as a juice loan maker and killer for the outfit and how it impacted him as a young man, as a member of his family, Frank Calabrese Jr. Thank you for being here, Frank. Thank you. We're on part two. We talked earlier quite a bit about your father, who he was, how you grew up, and we got to the point where you were in prison at Milan with your father. And we talked a little bit about how after a 20 year process, you came to begin to realize that you had only two choices. And, and, and one of them was to cooperate with the government. How was it when you were thinking about writing that letter to the FBI? Well, it was the hardest because in my neighborhood, cooperating with the government, they were the enemy. They were the enemy. <clears throat> and now I'm going to work with the enemy. Can I trust them? Can they trust me? You know, I've talked with the FBI agents that I worked with, uh, especially one, Mike Mesa. Um, we talk, you know, this was a hard relationship because we had to trust each other in a short period of time sitting in a prison room, nobody knowing that we're talking, and we had to, you know, build some kind of relationship. Um, and so I sat down and I really thought this out. How am I going to do this? You know, uh, I didn't want to be obligated. I didn't want to get other people in trouble. My job, my I shouldn't say my job. Um, my goal was to just keep my dad locked up. My goal wasn't to take down the mob, not some righteous person. I just wanted to, for me and the people around me, family members, to be able to, to start our life over again. So that was what the reason was behind it. So I thought to not be obligated if I do all my time, if I pay all my fines, that I might have a little more leverage with them. And that's how I started it out. Well, Frank, what, you talked about how you're, you were raised to think the government was the enemy and that cooperating was the last thing you could do. But prior to you, uh, really only one man with the kind of information you had had ever cooperated against the Chicago mob, and that's Lenny Patrick. Mm -hmm. Were you aware of him, and what, what did you think of him, and how was he talked about? Well, Lenny Patrick, uh, Frank Collada. Frank Collada was talked a lot about because he was close around us. You know, we, my dad knew him. We knew his brother, the barber. So, um, you know, Lenny Patrick, I didn't know anything about. You know, and sometimes when they look at something like that, they say, oh, well, he's not Italian, and that's why. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I really never – paid much attention. I, what I did pay attention about with Lenny Patrick was what I learned, what my dad learned and my uncle and me, we learned about a law that the government had. There was this law that they, that they brought into effect that they can lock up a criminal organization for a 10 year investigation if they feel that uh, a cooperating witness or somebody is, 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 there's a threat against their life. Because when Lenny Patrick's daughter had the car, I think it was blown up or something happened to her car, or all, BMW was okay. All the mob lawyers, the government got a hold of all the mob lawyers and told them. So word was sent out from the bosses to stay away, don't go nowhere near anybody in that family. So it's funny when how you know the rules can change really quick. So I, I thought that was uh, I thought that was interesting. Um, so I realized that uh, that the, the the government had a lot of, a lot of power. You know, I was raised to not trust them but to show respect. And the reason my dad used to say that was is because you don't want to make it personal. He says, you see the movies, guys spit at them, guys will yell at them, guys. He says, you don't want to make it personal. You want the FBI, you want to be like the FBI. You want them to think that you're their friend. You know, I'm doing your job. But you want them to go back and say, you know, Calabrese ain't really a bad guy. You know, so just don't make the same mistake that Sam Giancana made by right. infuriating the FBI. Right, more like a Carter. So it was always said on the street with um, a Romer that a, Romer was trying to play a Carter, but that a Carter was playing Romer back. So they had a relationship based on a bunch of lies. He told Romer what he wanted Romer to know, and Romer told him what he wanted to know. So it was, I guess, a, like business, like most businesses would do. So, um, yeah, and so that, that, that's what we were taught. So 
it was more of my concern was this. This is going to be, this is going to take at least 10 years. So the guys I'm going to start with, you know, what they're telling me eight years down the line, it may change, you know, and I've seen that a couple of times. So the, the, the FBI and the prosecutor, everybody started with Mitch Myers was an unbelievable smart man. I was in awe at how smart this man was. He dedicated his career. John Scully, I had a relationship with John. John was a nice guy too. Um, um, and, you know, everything they told me, they kept to, okay? One of it was, okay, um, I don't want to involve any of my legitimate friends or any family members. If you guys interview them, if you question them, if you indict them, I'm done. I'll do 20 years in jail before I cooperate. Uh, another thing was at a point when I decided to go out on the street and wear a wire against a couple of guys to show my fa what my father was doing, one agreement was that they were going to be um, unindicted co-conspirators. And they were. They were unindicted co-conspirators. A couple of them wound up getting up on the stand. So it was not my intention to hurt anybody else. Okay, and I don't believe I, I did hurt anybody else. And one of those people who was never mentioned turns out to be John DeFranzo. Any insight into that? Yeah, I, 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 I like I, spoke, I, I, I said earlier, um, I, it's in inner circles on the street, there's a lot of belief that John DeFranzo was cooperating with the government, that he was the one high ranking undercover um, informant that they had. Top echelon. Yeah. Top echelon, yeah. Yeah, top echelon, yeah. I, well, that's as top as you get. So when, when the FBI first came out to um, uh, Milan, Michigan, you got to understand that the hard part about this is that prison, the, the walls speak. It's small. I had to get to a building where they were without anybody seeing me going down this hallway in this building to this door to go upstairs. I actually spoke to them when they came about dressing a certain way so you don't look like FBI agents coming in. You know, dress more preppy like, you know, your young guys. But, um, and um, when I found out later that uh, Tom Bourgeois was the one I wrote the letter to, if you read the letter. Now, the reason I wrote him the letter, I didn't know anybody, but his name was on my pre PSI stuff as the FBI agent, a part of the case. So that's where I wrote him. And when I talk about writing the letter, I did everything my dad taught me. You know, I wore gloves, no fingerprints, type it, no handwriting. Don't put anything personal in there. If it gets intercepted, I can say, Dad, somebody's trying to set me up. It's just general stuff. It took them months to come out. I didn't even know if they were going to come out. And their concern was, what do I want? At first, they thought I was doing bad time. I and mean, then mm -hmm. they realized this guy's not doing bad time. In fact, the second time they came back, I'm in excellent shape. I look great. That's what they're looking at. Is this kid worn down? Is he having a hard time? So they brought Mitch Myers out. They actually brought Mitch out. He sat with me. And when he left that day, he says, don't bring this kid in front of a grand jury. Just work with him. He's fine. So I never went in front of a grand jury. Everything, and I worked, I worked with them the way. And uh, they, they gave me a lot of leeway to leave what I was doing. And, and, and they trusted me at some point because it was working. So what's going on with your family? I mean, did, they didn't know any of this until the indictments came out, right? Yeah, I, I couldn't keep, I, I could, I had to keep it in the dark. I couldn't trust anybody, um, uh, you know, for the simple reason that I couldn't take that chance. You know, I even told the FBI, I said, look, don't keep bringing people. You know, we've had people, we had a person in the FBI that would feed us information. He gave us some good information a couple of times, you know. We don't know if it was, it was plotted like that or if he did it on his own, but still, I couldn't. I can't take a chance. I'm in prison. If somebody sees me go to a certain room and I come out, I'm not going to know until I'm dead on the prison yard. When I decided to wear a wire on the prison yard, the warden didn't want to okay. This kind of stuff don't go on in prison. This guy's going to get killed. Right. When I'm able to wear it, I never realized this. They told me later on when we were talking. When I left that room with the FBI agents, I had a wire. They couldn't let monitor me. I was on my own. I was gone. They said, we'd sit in there sometimes for five hours waiting for you. We were waiting. Either you were coming back or the prison alarm went off that you're dead in prison. You know, and, um, you know, my dad is very smart. You know, a lot of old timer ways he has, you know, checking you for wires, everything. So I was able to um, 
tell them, give them ideas of the kind of wires to make for me. And they went to Quantico and they made them, you know. Um, so we built a relationship. We weren't friends. It was a business relationship. You know, we're not sitting there talking about families and buddies. It's not social hour. I mean, it was a job. In fact, one time they brought one agent and the other agents talk about it forever. I just got back from meeting with my dad. You know, you got to understand, I'm talking to my dad here. I'm putting him away forever. And another thing is we're talking about a relationship. That's hard on your mind. I go back to my cell sometimes and tears be coming down my eyes. I wouldn't sleep a wink all night because I'm like, this is how sick it got. And the guy's offering me cookies and he thinks it's all a joke. And the other agent, because I just looked at him like, you know, and I, I didn't say anything. I'm like, are you fucking crazy? You want to give me a cookie? What am I, your doggy? You know, um, but the other guys, I guess they, they laughed about it. It was a huge impact on them for a long time. Um, and uh, we just, you know, we built a relationship. And it was, it, it, till this day, it was a business relationship. That's it. You know, there's no friendship. But obviously, I, obviously I you trusted them. Yeah, I, I think we should also circle back to, you know, what people would say, well, why wouldn't you trust the FBI? I think when you look at the history, in, in, in the 80s, Cleveland had Jerry Rabinowitz, who was a secretary for the mob, and she gave up mob informants. She was in, she was working for the FBI. She was a secretary, and she was able to get the names of people who were informing for the FBI, and she got uh, the names of people who were working with, with uh, Chicago on the uh, – Operation Pendorf with Joey Lombardo and uh, and um, Alan Dorfman. She was working in Cleveland during this trial. Frank, it, as as you know, when when uh, uh, later uh, your uncle was in hiding, they had a, a okay, U.S. March. Everything all right? Yeah, we're good. I just lost sound for a minute. Okay, sorry. I, I thought I didn't have sound. So, you know, the, 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 the mob had a, a U.S. Marshal at this time. So it's not enough to just assume, well, they're FBI agents so they can be trusted. Not only did you grow up that the government is the enemy, but there's multiple, it, there's so many instances of, of the mafia actually having not, not just law enforcement, but federal law enforcement under their belts. So this was really a huge risk that you were taking, and they had a lot to do to prove to you that, that you would be safe and that you could trust them. So it, this was really, it, it was really a heavy burden on you to turn on your family, and like you said, to go to the enemy, but just to know that you were safe with, with guys you've seen could be turned. Yeah, and I never felt safe. It wasn't about that. It was about, you no, know, but, it, was yeah. about, it was about what I had to do. I was right, willing right. No, I even offered to go back in prison for a while one time with my dad. And they're like, you know, it sounds great and dandy to us. It would probably be unbelievable. But um, legalities, we would, if something happened to you, it would, yeah. you know. Right. So my determination, yeah. And, 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 you know, one thing I learned from my dad, trust no one. You know, the old scorpion and the uh, frog. Uh, you know, I, I even have a tattoo on my arm about it. You know, it, it's need to know. I, I, I need to trust myself and that's it. Mm -hmm. And I need to, um, you know, I needed to do what I needed to do. And my dad taught me when you're, and I, I imagine in the military too, when you have a task to do, you worry about task at hand. You train for that task, you prepare for the task. You don't sit down and think about what could happen. You just do what you got to do and be ready. And that's what I put in my head when I was there, it's not about what could happen. I know what could happen, but you know what? I had a job to do and I had to finish. Sadly, I had to do against my own father, which was the hardest, you know. And it'll never be easy. And I'll never have an easy day because you always wonder, could there have been another way? And that was another thing I was doing while I was doing this. I sat down for months. There's got to be another way. There's got to be another way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Frank, let me ask you, in that, when it was over, um, and even today, you know, there's some clown somewhere in the mob, some wise guy. Did they? Did you? Did you fear? Do you fear that they're going to? You know, this guy took out his father. I'm going to shoot him. I mean, was that a, ever a concern for you? Because you know, well, it's it's always a concern. I, I got lucky in some ways. Is that there was a lot of guys out there that would have came after me. That either got a couple of them got killed, and the rest died naturally in a short period of time. Yeah. Now, read my book. If you if you've been on my tours, 
I am not taking you around and saying, Joe and Tony over here are doing this and that. Mm -hmm. I am not, you know, I'm telling a family story on my tours. I respect the guys who are out there. I've got, honestly, when I first came back to Chicago, I wasn't sure. I had my guard up, but I'm not one to run and hide. I'm not getting in anybody else's business. You know, if somebody wants to get me, they can get presidents, they say. So, um, you know, uh, there's always that chance. You know, my dad put a $150,000 hit on my head when he was still Okay, that was big, you know, the FBI had to let me know, okay. People on the street, some people were saying, yeah, well, you know what, your dad didn't like to pay. And number two, a lot of people say, yeah, we liked, we liked uh, Junior better than Senior when we dealt with him. Mm -hmm. So I've gotten a lot of guys that say, you know, I don't necessarily agree with what you did, but I've worked with your father. I've been around your father. He's a very difficult man. Mm -hmm. um, I, people tell me that things are a lot better now because these guys are gone. They were, you know, you're talking about guys that come up to you and tell you, you got to start paying me you know, $1,000, $2,000 a month. And if you don't, they're going to ruin your life, right? Yeah. And, a lot of guys, and I'm talking about guys who are making legitimate money. So mm -hmm. I hear sometimes that I did a lot of people a favor. Uh, the mafia is a thing of the past with the Italian-American mafia. A lot yeah. of people have moved on. There's a lot of guys that were in the life that were younger that have moved on to legitimate things. They're making money. I'm not getting in anybody's pockets. I'm not getting in, in, in anybody in trouble. I don't care what anybody's doing. You know, sometimes people start to tell me about stuff. I said, I don't want to hear it. They say, why? I said, because if I hear it and somebody hears I heard it, they're going to automatically think I'm the one that said it. I don't want to hear it. It doesn't, you know, I had guys come up to me, ask me to do something when I got back. And was, I says, are you, you know, I cooperated against my dad. Yeah, but that was between you and your dad. You've always been good with me. I said, no, I, I'm sorry. You know, I don't want to hear it. So there's always that chance that somebody could come up. You know, um, now that I do tours more than ever, I've had a few people get in my car, one guy with a backpack, you know, and, um, you know, I says, here, let me put the backpack in the back seat here so we got more room. Why don't you sit in the front seat? You know, um, I'm not challenging anybody. I'm not standing in the corner with my muscles. Uh, there's certain places I won't go in. I respect uh, what some people are capable of. But I'm not one to run and hide either. This is between me and my dad. If you want to get in the middle of it, then you know, do what you got to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. Frank. Um, let's quell a rumor that I read. In fact, you, there's so much out there about you. Uh, you and your brother Kurt are are at ends. You you know you you don't talk. You fight. Blah, blah, blah. What's the story? What's the truth? What's going on? What? So I have two brothers, Kurt and Nikki. Um, me and Kurt, um, we are brothers. We do not fight. Sometimes we, we have the same disagreements that brothers have. One thing that was very important to us over time was to learn how to get through all this as family, even though we might not agree. So me and my brother sit down sometimes and we'll butt heads. We don't raise our voices, not disrespectful. We'll butt heads. There's times sometimes we might not talk for a month or two because we don't agree on something. But in the end, we all sit at the family table. We respect one another. He's my brother. I'm his brother. All three of us. And, um, you know, it's very important to us. You know, and, and um, you know, my brother Kurt has been through a lot, okay? My dad put my brother Kurt in a lot of positions that my brother didn't deserve to be in. And my brother goes through a lot right now with that. And he's having a hard time dealing with that. You know, think about it, you know. Why would your dad do stuff to you? Me and my dad, we did stuff to each other, okay? My brother never did nothing to my dad other than go to jail with him, for him. Is he getting help? Is he professional? Yeah, you know, and that's for him to talk yeah. about. And I know yeah. that he's involved I, in a lot of projects and stuff. And, and you know, I, I can tell you one thing he asked me is, how do you do it? And I says, I told him the way I found how to do it. You know, not only did I have to get past this, but, you know, the day I went in prison, what? I thought I was never going to do cocaine again. I didn't know. What? It's been 97 now, okay? It's the most embarrassing thing I ever did, but I talk about it because you have to own it, okay? And I got past it. What gets me, Frank, is I think, you know, the average, the, I'm, I'm sorry, John, but I, I think that the average family has, has, has problems, but I think that because of the spotlight that's been placed on you because of the trial and because of who your father is and just the mystique of, of, of the mafia, I think that it's got to be hard for y'all because any disagreements you have as brothers is going to be blown up into this 
Oh, you know, like like John said, they're at war. They're you know, these two brothers, these mob. Bro you know, it's. I think that it, that's got to put an extra burden on on any sort of disagreement or anything that y'all have. I think that that probably shines an extra spotlight. Like like John said, you know, there's rumors and people talk online. So I, I think that, that puts puts an extra bit of pressure sometimes. Sure, you know, my brother will get on. He'll get on stuff sometimes. He'll say, "I disagree with my brother." That's not the mm -hmm. story. Okay, and, and he has the right to say that, you know. And, and, and social media is going to blow that up. Talked about it's, you know, you see it one way, I see it another way, and and but we can at the end of the day, it's it's okay. I'm not mm -hmm. trying to convince him. He's not trying. We both have our reasons why we see it a certain way, and I and it's more important for us. But sure, people like to see the drama. They would love to see. Yeah. Show me and my brother going at each other or anything. You know? yeah. 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 You know. Let me ask you uh, two things. Uh, let me tell you, as a therapist, and she deals in trauma, childhood trauma that develops. Well, I, I'm really interested in, in, in what you're saying, and I, I hear about it every day, and are not specifics, but, um, and they can help people, as you know. Um, I don't want to cross the line here. But you have two daughters, right? No, my daughter, Kurt has two daughters and a stepson. And you? I have a boy and a girl. So my daughter is just turning 30. My son's turning 29. So, I, you know, my boy asked me um, about my father and my mother. You know, I'm selective. He, it, it, it's, they're dead. It's, it, how do you deal with it? How do you, uh, do you say, yeah, this guy, but, or do you... Yeah, but there was the other half. You know. It's it's very hard. One thing that me and my brother agree on 100% is our kids are the most important thing in our life. Yeah. Okay, um, I can never take back any pain or anything my kids went through mm -hmm. while I was in prison. It rips me apart. My kids laugh and they tell me, Dad, you know, you should go to counseling for you. We're okay. You have a hard time letting go. You know, you got to let go. So my daughter is my voice of reason, and so is my son. And I look up to both of them. And, um, and both of them have nothing of this life in them. They weren't around it. Um, my son chose for a while not to know a lot of stuff because he didn't want to know about it. Uh, my daughter had a hard time, like when she talked about a nightline, was watching, you know, Godfather, stuff like that. But I've... I mean, I got a second chance of life with my kids. Yeah. They love me. They've seen me for the last 20 years, who I've become, how hard I work. They're so proud of me. Uh, their mother, who my ex-wife, who we're, we're, we're still friends, we're still close. Um, you know, one day Anthony was like, you know, dad this or dad that. And, and, and Kelly's like, you know, to really understand, I mean, my, my wife, ex-wife was like, to really understand your dad, you know him now, you need to know how he was before and what he went through to get to where he is now. So when I was writing the book, my son, I had him help me, you know, on the computer because he's very smart and everything. And, and then um, when I went to L.A. and uh, uh, working on some stuff, I would bring him as my assistant, like, you know, just so he get to know me. So my relationship with my kids are are is very good. Um, they're close with their cousins, my brother Kurt's kids. They're all close because they can relate, you know, because they've been through the same thing. Uh, Kurt, his kids are the most important thing to him, you know, and, um, you know, it's hard because you don't want to affect um, what you're going through. You don't want it to affect them because it, it does, right? I mean, if they see you down, if they see you depressed, if they see you, so yeah. it's hard, but um, we have the chance to work at that every day. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the luckiest guys in the world, you know, for where I'm at now. Yeah. So. Yeah. Kids make a difference and they're resilient. Yeah. And, and I, I told my brother, you know, we grew up around a lot of legitimate friends that have done very well for themselves. Yeah. And I says, Kurt, you know, don't let that bother you. Don't compare to where you're at right now because we went through a lot. I says, just own what you do. If you're going to clean toilets, be the best toilet cleaner. Your friends will respect you for that. You yeah. know, it's the same thing here. I mean, right now, I'm working at the Marriott out here, okay? This is what I do when I'm not doing my stuff. I started at the bottom, and I worked my way up. I learned computers because I had to know. I took a computer class in prison so I could learn computers. Good for you. You know, mm -hmm. so, it, so I, yeah, I'm an, I, I am very lucky. And also, it's, you know, and I have to go through this every day. You know, you, no matter how many times you go over it, you're not going to change it. Right. 
and you think about it and you get, you know, it's a matter of living in trauma of right now, right? And you have to stop yourself from going back there. Yeah. There ain't nothing back there except pain and misery. We tend to uh, forget. You know, it's easy to remember some of the good times, but inevitably the bad times take over. And it's a waste of life, man. You know, it's a... Yeah, you can do it. Have, Everybody has a different way of letting it go. So what might work for me might not work for my brother or right. somebody else. So yeah. I talk about what works for me, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. I never did talk, and um, I had two heart attacks. I, I couldn't eat spicy food. Yeah, well, I, you know, I kept it in, and then I, my wife said, look, you know, this isn't working. Right. And you know what? That changed everything, really. It changed everything, so. No, I, well, you know, I got out of jail, and I had this plan. You know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I got all this stuff, and all of a sudden, my, I start getting drop foot. I get diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis. So um, I, I was like, that's it. I, I, I can't feel sorry for myself. I'm going to be the poster child for MS. I'm going to be the guy that's going to walk till I'm 80 and say, look, see, I beat it. You know, I did what I had to do. I'm doing it. Um, and, you know, because that's the hand I was dealt and I'm going to make the best of it. So how, how is your health right now? How is your health right now, Frank? My health how, how are you, you feeling? You doing pretty well? I went to the neurologist two years ago. So when I got the MS, I was going to Loyola in Chicago in Elmhurst and uh, the neurologist was like, you have to slow deteriorating. He says, and whatever you're doing, cause I came out of prison in such good shape and so healthy, eating healthy, he says, just keep doing it for right now. You'll come back, we'll see what'll happen. Yeah. And I'm not gonna put you on any meds or studies because it's just gonna eat your body away. So I moved out to Arizona and I just learned to deal with it, I, you know, with my legs, losing the muscle, and I just would work out all the time. So 17 years later, I come back to Chicago, and I go see one of the best neurologists in the state, and he's on the state board, everything up in Northbrook, and he says, he goes, he goes, unbelievable. He says, I don't know what you're doing, he says, but it's been dormant. He goes, and um, just keep doing what you're doing. He goes, I do a lot of Chicago beers. He goes, you have no muscle, no nothing in your legs. He goes, but you've learned to compensate. He says, your upper body's strong like some of these football players. He said, but um, I'm not going to put you in any studies. He goes, your, your MS is not active. He says, it hasn't been active. He said, I don't think it's going to be active anymore. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're going to grow old like most people. Oh, good for you. That's wonderful. So I fall once in a while because I'll trip, you know, but I've learned to fall where I don't hurt myself. Yeah. The most thing is it, it, the embarrassing that I fall. I want to get up right away and say, okay, it's okay, it's okay. Some days when my arthritis is bothering me too, I use a cane. That has been less and less as I've went on. So I'm, I'm very proud of it. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, and, and I just want to be, you know, inspiration to other people that, you know, we're all going to get dealt shit in life. Mm -hmm. There's no way to get around it. It's going to make you who you are. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm also... Uh, I got one leg, basically. I walk on one leg. You know, I mean, I have two legs. But. Right. But you've learned to compensate with the one, right? So Yeah, yeah. yeah. I gave up my hopes of tap dance and, you know. Yeah, uh, I, I, I had to give up a lot, too, but then I found other things. You know, they wanted to put a brace on my leg. And I said, if you put a brace on my leg for my footfall, and those muscles are going to be gone. So I said, mm -hmm. no, I'll figure it out. And that's what I did. And, and I think by doing that... You know, because sometimes the doctors ain't always right. You know, I, yeah. I just didn't want to give in to that. I didn't want to be on any drugs. I didn't want to give in to any, anything. So I got a cane and I keep working out. Good. So you can drive around and the tour. I drive everything, yeah. Yeah. When oh. I came home from prison, I started driving a semi in the city because I needed to get work. I needed to do something that I could do anywhere in the country. Let me ask you a nosy question. I mean, you, but even you said yourself, your, your dad had a, gobs of money hanging around over here and everything. Uh, and then we got the Hanley family. That guy, Mr. Hanley, he probably did okay. What what happened? I mean, did every where did the money go? Um I believe his ex-wife got a lot of it. I'm sure there's some other people that were holding it for him. Uh, you know, people all the time telling me. I had one distant family member say, hey, you know, at the cemetery, Queen in Heaven, you know how they didn't bury this, that, there. You know, I bet you there's some there. I got this thing. Do you want to go? And I just looked and I said, no. I says, I don't want to go. I believe the money's cursed. 
there's money somewhere. I don't care. You know, I, it's, well, I, don't care. I done that. <laughs> I ain't going to do it again. Okay. It's yeah. just, it's just, I don't know. I hope whoever has the majority of it or whoever that, that they really need it and they do the right thing with it. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to see my mother get something because my dad uh, didn't leave her with anything. Okay. Uh, he manipulated her, control it. She's got a heart of gold and um, she really caught the raw end of the deal, but you'll never hear my mother bad mouth them. She just yeah. Isn't there a story that your dad had all kinds of money stashed in the wall of a house up in Wisconsin or something like that? Or stashed in the walls? He was, uh, no, there was buried. It was buried. buried. Yeah, it was buried and then they just, they didn't put it in anything but duffel bags and then it got all moldy. So we had to go out and uh -huh. it out. We're talking about, you know, maybe a million dollars. And wow. Another story. There was another story that, and, and it was more of a setup that, um, that I went up to the cottage because he had a lot of money in there and I robbed him and I took that and I took cars, a bunch of his antique cars. So in court, they brought all these people that bought in the, that bought these cars and everything. And the government was concerned to say, Frank, if you did this, please just tell us it's going to come out. I said, no, I didn't. But they're bringing the people. I says, I'm telling you, I have nothing to do with it. They had a big picture of me up on the screen. And the people are like, no, he's not the guy. And they're trying to describe the guy. And it's all different guys and whatever. And I think it was another setup by my dad. So he was looking for something to, um, he wanted to take the focus of the trial away from the tapes and the yeah. murder. Try and discredit you. He had his lawyer start asking me about money. So you said you stole 800000 You know, what did you do? I, so I just kept, I said, look, I stole a lot of money and um, I blew it up. And if anybody was in the court, they seen it. So the, he kept trying to break it down to try to catch me in a lie or something. The judge finally said, hey, I don't care if he took 800000 or $2 million. We, we We have it that he took money from his dad and he blew it. Don't ask him no more questions about it. So he was constantly trying to detour from it. Yeah, yeah. We kind of skipped over something that, that's just fascinating to me. And that is that first moment, that first day when you're in the witness stand mm -hmm. and you had to, your yeah. father's looking right at you and who else is in the courtroom and what was that moment like for you? Was your family in the courtroom? What were you thinking and what were you feeling? Okay, so my family, we didn't want, I didn't want any of my family there. He didn't want any of his family there. Okay, so um, my uh, ex-wife, the kids, they were out here in Arizona. My mother wasn't there. My brother, Kurt, was there. He was sitting in the gallery. Uh, my brother, Nikki wound up coming later during the trial, but he sat in another room and listened to it. So when I was brought in to Chicago, um, I didn't sleep. I might have slept one or two nights. All I did... They wanted to get me on the stand. It was right before the 4th of July. So they had me on the stand for an hour. And, you know, I asked the night before to go sit in the courtroom, if I could sit in the courtroom for a while. So they had to get the marshals, this big official thing. And I sat in the courtroom in that chair for about a half hour. I looked around the courtroom and looked where my father was going to be sitting and everything like that. I wanted to get a feel for it. The next day when I went in there, they told me, go up in front of the judge and raise your right hand. So I walk up to the judge and I step up on the platform and I'm right in his face. I'm not in the, on the witness chair. And later on, they were all laughing at me, but I didn't know. I raised my right hand. I'm right in his face, you know, and I'm repeating after him. And I sit down and I'm like, why did you go up like that? I said, you told me to go in front of him. I don't know where I'm going. I wouldn't make eye contact with my, my father because the emotions, I mean, well, I should say when I didn't make eye contact with him, but I glanced over and there's my dad who's aged. I haven't seen him in six years. And I'm ready to put this man away for his life. I was just so overcome with emotion because I'm his protector, but I'm also his, um, his prosecutor. Yeah. Yeah. I sat down and I was probably the worst witness there was for, um, first of all, the judge told me they had the microphone. I kept grabbing it, like that, and the whole courtroom's going like that. That's how nervous I was. Um, I got out of there. The next three days, I sat with Mitch Myers and Mike Mesa and, 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 and John Scully in the war room in the FBI's floor, and all I did was go over everything and prepare myself for the rest, rest of the case. And when I went back in there three days later, I was ready. 
the emotion was past me and this was all business. And um, yeah, I, it's, I'll never forget all that. It was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. You know, the, 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 the glance that me and my father had at one point, you know, like, you know, father and son that hadn't seen each other for years. And here's the whole world watching this. How long were you on the stand, Frank? Oh, God, I think it was almost a week. Must have been the longest week of your life. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was, it was long. It was long. Um, now, the, F, the prosecutors have people in the gallery that, that are there to see how everything's going. So they'll critique it at the end. of it. So the first day was on there, me and John. So John uh, Scully was the one that was handling me. So we were getting up there, we're showing the uh, transcripts and we're playing videos and all that. And John would ask me questions. So um, at the end of that day, uh, the people are like, that's not working. We're confused. It's not working. So I came up with an idea and I told John, why don't we do it like this? Why don't you play the tape? Uh, you know, be like, um, you know, maybe four paragraphs. I'll say what I feel about what, what he said during that four paragraphs. And then you can ask me questions after. He goes, okay, let's try that. So I would sit there while I'm playing the tape and I'd use my fingers. Okay, I'm going to talk about that on that part. I'm going to talk about that. And then as I'm answering it after, I'm touching my fingers to remember. And the, they came back and they said, that's perfect. It's working perfect. So that's what we did the rest of the time. It was, it was a lot of translation, wasn't it, Frank? Because the code that your father spoke, it, it was so intricate. I've, I've heard some, even when he was talking to, to, to Tuan Doyle and all, but hearing you and your father speak, it, it's almost, if you didn't know what you were talking about, you, you know, you're talking about going to her house, and it's just incredible how intricate the two of you were speaking. Well, the video that you'll see on YouTube the, called The Curly Girl, and they show the video, and they played that at the trial, it's with me and Ralph Peluso, and it says we're talking about recipes. So me and John Scully are sitting there going over everything, and he's like, okay, at this part, you guys are talking about recipes, right? I don't know, that, that's code for this and this and this. He goes, oh, okay. And then he goes, okay, and this part is code? I go, no, that's really a recipe. Because you guys were good. <laughs> still getting confused. And, and, and it was, it was good. I mean, somebody says, Jesus, it sounds like you're having a conversation about six different people, you and your dad. And all we're talking about is me with four different code names. But yeah, it was, it was, so what I would do, now this is the biggest thing for uh, any, any legal people is, um, you know you can't testify to a conversation if you weren't present, right? As soon as you get up there to start testifying against that conversation or for that conversation, they're going to, uh, uh, they're going to uh, uh, reject it. You're right. Yes. So, so sometimes I think I got hit in the head too many times. Um, so Mitch Myers tells me you're going to get up there and you're going to talk about the conversation between your dad, Doyle, and Mike Ricky about the purse, about the glove and all that. He says, and I want you to say in your own words what you think the conversation is. They're going to they're gonna probably um, knock you off right away, but it's worth trying. What was the word that I was looking for? It's hearsay. Okay. It? Hearsay. Hearsay. Yeah. So I get up there, start talking. The lawyers jump up. I got to go in the other room. They have a sidebar. Mitch walks in, not like, all right. He walks in. He goes, all right, come on back in. You're going to testify to that. So... Zagel, everything I testified to, he's behind me. He's got the transcripts. He's just looking for one thing, a very smart, just one thing that's out of line, knowing that I might not be telling the truth. And he knew I was telling the truth under the, do you know he let it go? He said, no, nope, bring it back in. They tried to appeal it, but they lost. So I would say is during my conversations with my dad or any of these guys, purse meant this. This is what I'm always understanding. And it was unbelievable because the lawyers couldn't believe it. I mean, that's how smart Mitch was. You know, and uh, that was huge. That was huge. He was a very, very good lawyer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he died way too young. Yeah, he's very so young. At the end, you have your cross and your recross. So they had my Uncle Nick up there, and they, and they did the recross. Is that, am I saying the right words? Anybody yes. Else? Yeah. Okay. And you can, only, you can only recross on what they talked about on the cross. And Mitch got up there, and he says, When's the last time you seen your nephew or talked to your nephew? So he gives him a date from, you know, before we went to jail. And he says, have you ever seen any of the transcripts or heard any of the, you know, any of the tapes? He said, no. He said, that's it. He said, um, they, they couldn't recross on anything because all they'd have to ask about is the tapes. Now, we knew 
that the lawyers were staying away from the tapes because they were all loaded. So they didn't even want the tapes to be played because they, they heard them. They knew what was going on. So it was really a, a chess game. And um, in, in the legal world, it was a great trial to watch because it was the first time they used the RICO Act the way it was supposed to be used. And that's to go after an organization and, you know, instead of the individuals. Even the guy that wrote the act, I think he was a professor at... Uh, Robert, Robert Blakey, yeah. Yeah, he was a professor at Notre Dame or something, was he? Or? Yeah, Notre Dame, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and, and he was all over it too because he kept telling the government, you're not using this right, you're not using this right. And it was the first time in Chicago they used right. Because remember, they used it in New York. New York, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and it works. So it was... Um, that's an interesting point. Yeah, that's a... Yeah, uh, I, I did. I, I learned a lot there, you know, but it was, it was, it was probably the hardest time in my life, you know, um, when there was a, a break or, or a recess or what, and we're all sitting in there and they're doing something, you know, I just sat with my head down. You know, first of all, I, these guys sit in this room, you know, I respected what they were capable of. They're not my problem, but, um, you know, it's still, you know, this, and then there's my dad sitting over there. Everybody's talking to everybody, joking around. I'm just sitting there. And it's just, you know, I wanted to be anywhere but there. Yeah. yeah. Most, well, I'm sorry. It, yeah. It's, it's, uh, people that cooperate, it never, most people that cooperate never think it's going to make it to court. I knew this was going to court. Yeah. Frank, yeah. what, when the jury went out to deliberate, did it ever cross your mind that they might acquit your father? Oh, I, I, yeah, I didn't, I, I, I made a comment and I was asked to stop making that comment. I, first of all, I told the FBI, if you guys get a deal with my dad and he's out, I can guarantee you that I will be at that prison door with a shotgun waiting for him the second he comes out because that's my best odds of getting him. And they go, you can't talk like that. I said, well, that's, that's the way it is. They said, the only way we'd give your dad a deal is if he knew where Hoffa was buried and we found the body and if they, if he could prove he killed Kennedy. That's what they told me. Um, also, I, I learned later on that they profiled. That's the high standard. Yeah, that's, that's setting the bar. Yeah, so, um, but um, I, yeah, actually, um, every year I would go to Las Vegas with a bunch of friends opening football weekend for a couple of days. You know, we're getting older. We sit around, just watch some games, have some coffee, a beer or something and talk. And they happened to come back the days I was out there. I don't know, remember, I was sitting by Caesars by the pool and it was all over the news everywhere. And I, I just had to go sit in a room by myself for a couple hours. And it just, you know, it wasn't like, yay, you know, it was just, it was just part of that whole, um, you know, damn, this is just, I wish, some days I wish my dad could be sitting here right now and, you know, I could be taking care of him. He's older now and, you know, I, I, I lost him. I lost that. I wish that when we both had a chance on that prison yard, because they had no idea what we were involved in, okay? We were going to go home in a few years. He was going to come home and we could have lived the rest of our lives, you know? Um, so there's always a part of me that just, if he would have just tried to change like I did and like everybody else wanted to do. Yeah, it wasn't going to happen, though, I don't think. No, it was not. It was not. He was too far gone. I ask you, so your father, after you... you but you moved out and so what uh, w w did you talk again or was that you know the government made sure that we would never be able to look mm -hmm. I the last time I talked to my father we were either going to work it out in the prison yard before I started cooperating or we were never going to talk again there was no reason for me to talk because of the fact that he would just manipulate me again he didn't change he wasn't going to change okay um my father's favorite day, I'll close like this. The favorite day, my father's favorite day of the year was Christmas. He was very generous at Christmas. Christmas was his favorite day. Okay, done a lot of stuff for a lot of people at Christmas. I get a phone call. My dad dies Christmas Day, locked in a cell like an animal in a terrorist lockdown for years. He dies at Christmas Day of heart failure. Now, my dad was a strong man. I honestly, he, he manipulated religion and everything. You know, I honestly believe that that day, and some people tell me I'm crazy for it, but I, I believe that day that my father finally got it. And I do believe he's above me. I do believe he's watching me and he's saying, hey, you little motherfucker, I'm watching you. I know you better than everybody. You better do the right thing. So I answer to him. Um, I've had my, so my daughter, um, 
Well, without getting my daughter involved in this, because she likes to give it. So um, there is a very big name um, uh, mediator, medium, okay, that in any time my daughter's friends with her, and, uh, and she's told my daughter a handful of times, if, um, you know, your, your grandfather is always in my ear whenever your dad's around. And if he wants to talk to him, we'll do it, you know. And, you know, I'm like, wow, man, I would love to. But then the, the downside of that, and people had said, he goes, you know, your dad never changed. How do you know he's not going to try to manipulate you again? Why don't you just let it be, do, it, do what you're doing, you know. And, 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 and that's, so that's what I'm doing because, you know, how do I know that he's not manipulating me to try to get me to do something wrong again so that I can wind up with him for eternity? Yeah, well, right. two things. I think all of us whose father, we had a difficult time, they, they passed on. We, we all feel that way. You know, you look back and it's just, you know, if I had just not been such a loudmouth moron, and I had, you know, and if he had not done, and yeah. everyone who has a dad that was, a, and a lot of us did, who was a difficult guy, we feel, but also I think, it, you know, I wouldn't listen to the people. I, he, he is, you know, and he is probably, probably I, I'm a Roman Catholic. He's in heaven. And, you know, that's good therapy for you. You know, I lost a brother. I wasn't able to deal with And he just, I, hell, I, I don't care what people say. Talk to him a lot. And I, uh, I have fake conversations with him. And he feel a hell of a lot better, Frank. I, oh, I, I talk to him all the time. Well, let me tell you something. I, um, you know, I, and I have that criminal mentality, okay? And I talk about this at the end of the chore. I, mean, you know, I have to process every day, okay? This is in your blood. You just don't wake up at one morning and say, oh, that's it, it's out of your blood. You know, I see things that other people don't see. I was good at what I did. I never got caught for anything. And it's not bragging in a good way. It's actually a curse to me. So I have to step back and I have to process when I start thinking like that. I see something and I'm like, oh my God, that'd be like taking candy from a kid, you know? So I have to step back in the process. One of the things I use is having to wind up with my father in hell for eternity, you know? Um, that's one of the things. And then I also look at, I'd be worse than my dad if I went back to, I'm a, I'm, I'm a hypocrite. I'm, I'm, you know, I could be the lowest scum of the earth if I do it. So, you know, I find my ways of processing so I don't do it. And I have, I've been doing that for, for 20 years. You know, I'll tell you one funny story in, in, in closing is I'm working at the hotel before my book came out and I'm with this younger guy. And I, have, I told you, I go to these Vegas trips where my friends are very well off. So they're gambling maybe 20, 30,000. I gamble 20 bucks, but that's, you know, I can gamble what I can afford. And the guy says, oh, Frank, you know my friend Larry that drives the White Hummer? I says, yeah, he lives in Paradise Valley. I says, yeah. He says he goes to Vegas all the time, too. In fact, he had, it, it, behind the picture in his front room, he has a safe. And sometimes we go over there drinking. He opens it up. He always keeps three to 500000 in there. He goes, why don't you come? We're going there Friday. I'll show it to you. You know, you know what I'm hearing? Oh, my God. One more <laughs> time, right? What do we say? One more time, and I'm good. I had to step back and process then I told the kid, I says, hey, don't be an idiot. You almost got your friend hurt or in trouble. And then I told him that he was just sitting there like this. I says, don't do that. You know, I wanted to go tell a friend, and don't be showing everybody where you keep your money. People breaking houses for that. So, yeah, I, I, and I think it's, I'm, I'm being tested. I salute. Yeah, thank you. That's a great story to, to, to wrap that up with starting out, what, everything you went through, everything you did, everything your father tried to make you into, and now you are able to see that criminal thinking process happen and step outside of it and, and truly be a different person. Yeah. So yeah. few people can do that. Versus 500,000? <laughs> yeah, it took some processing. Right. <laughs> dealing with a banano a former banano guy who went into the witness protection blah 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 and we're eating at a deli in my neighborhood and there's only us in the in the hall you know and the bill came and some guy left uh, a 50 dollar tip i don't know why he, I, I can't believe this he took the money he in other words he, he ended up giving the 20 he took the 50 but he did it in such a way in small bills and just a little the hell are you do? A, I live here. B, really? Did you really just do that? But that's his, 
he can't get out of it. Man. Well, yeah, you, it's, it's, it's an addiction. It's a high. Yeah, yeah. He's been kicked out of the program since, by the way. So, interesting guy. Yeah, there's a lot, yeah. lot, lot, there's a lot of interesting people that oh. – I have a support group with a lot of guys from New York, Vegas, all that. They were in the life. A lot of names you'll see out there and stuff. And sometimes we have calls because, you know, when I call it a support group, because we understand. So when we have stuff that happens to us, like one of the guys was telling me that, um, that uh, uh, you know, something had happened to him and it was like somebody handed him money and he's looking around for cameras thinking this guy, you know. Yeah. So we actually talk each other out of it. But when we have talked with a lot of people about doing a round table, where we just sit down and we talk about stories that you never hear, like we're talking about today, not who was the boss, who was the underboss, more about, you know. And we've done this on the phone, uh, um, and we haven't tried Zoom yet, but you would die laughing. And, you know, yeah. we with different uh, uh, stations and stuff. So I'm working on a movie project right now. I have a deal. Right. We're supposed to start filming in the fall but um because of this it's got pushed back but um yeah we uh it's funny because um we have some great stories it's it's unbelievable and we've talked about taping it geez you do that if you need help. yeah uh, 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 an ex-mob support group oh my god frank <laughs> oh my god yeah it's, it's, frank, it's the basis of a good comedy oh my god doesn't it yeah, you know, one of my favorite. Great idea. One of my favorite movies is My Blue Heaven with Steve Martin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm salivating at thinking about the potential of that. Sure. Yeah, My Blue Heaven. That's such a. That's that's literally the sequel to Goodfellas. I think yes. not many people know that. So Nora Ephron wrote it, who was married yeah. to Pelagi, which Nick gave a, a blurb on my book. Do you know Nora was the one that I was working with at the beginning? She loved this story. But unfortunately, she passed on. It would have probably been done by now. And, you know, um, she, uh, yeah, I mean, what a, what a woman. You've had, uh, had some, there's been some bad luck with people passing and telling yeah. your story. Yeah. You know, the opening chapter of that book is the gangsters meet the, at the round table and they have an hour-long fight over who's going to sit where because they don't want the other guy to be at the head of the table. Just the, you know, the whole back and forth. Write that and just keep going. Why don't you write it? Yeah, yeah. we're we're working on a lot of stuff. Yeah, Frank, yeah. it's it's a brilliant idea. I mean, it, it's incredible. If y'all just recorded your calls, you'd have you'd have the material. My God, you know what it, a great stage play that would make, John. Yeah, that's one we were talking about too. Is you know just to be able to sit with the group and um, you know and just. You know, just like they're part of the table. You know, like they're part of the conversation. Sit with a bunch of people, and you're out to dinner or something. And we just you know what? That's a stage play because there's one scene. I, exactly. I'd set it's it like up like twelve angry men. men. Yeah. yeah. I just make it twelve made men. <laughs> twelve made men. There you go. You know, and what's cool about this group is that these are guys that that changed their life. And there's some big name guys in there too, but they literally changed their life and every, all of us have been out of prison 20 years or more because you um, most guys go back they just can't they they, they try That's, for a little bit and they go back and hearing I'm, hearing well, your story 25 years you and have not gone back and and you've really completely changed everything coming from your up from from where you came from what you've been through the lifestyle you lived who your father was and and you really You've, you've completely changed everything about yourself. Like you said, that is always still in the back of your head, but you don't act on it. And it's just really quite a story that, that you that you've lived. Yeah, I, I, thank you. You know, you know, I, I, um, a lot of people just don't understand how I can still function normally, but I found my way to do it, and that's what yeah. I. Yeah, you know, it's like, a battle every day. I should think it's the little victories that mean a lot to me. Yeah. And, yeah. And my sons, my, my kids tell me how much they love me, how proud. A lot of my friends that have stood by my side that are proud. You know, when they tell me Frank works harder than anybody. I had, I had kids telling me, I'm 60 years old now, right? I had some had kids telling me after I worked a 16-hour shift, how do you do it? You know, yeah. I says, hey, you know, you, you do what you got to do. And they're like, no, it's old man standing. That's what you got old man standing. No, no. 
Yeah. <laughs> they call it work ethic. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, the kids are like that, though. You know, are we going to write all day? Yeah. Oh, oh. Hey, Kev, let's uh, let's watch the record <laughs> before we start talking about the generations. Let's watch <laughs> what we're recording. <laughs> Well, generations or not, with th almost 30 years in the criminal system, I can tell you that it's exceedingly rare. As, as a matter of fact, the most rare beast is the truly reformed. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, uh, as, as we say, find Jesus in jail, but most leave him there. And they might find him again, and they leave him again. Boy. And you have a real genuine story of somebody who has really changed. I and it's not I like you were, what's that? I'm sorry. I watched a lot of people that I didn't think would come back while I was, while I was in prison. I seen them come back. And it was one of the saddest things I ever seen because I, it's just such a waste of life in prison. You know, especially with federal prison. If you're, if you're a street guy and you go to prison, it's like being on the street. So you can get very comfortable very fast. But it's just such a waste of life. And you know who suffers? Not us. The people on the outside that love you, they're the ones that suffer. Yeah. You know? And to watch these people stand by these guys' side and watch some of these guys come back for some, some of the pettiest shit, it just it, 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 it shocked me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Frank, where where are you now? What in your life? What what uh, what, what do you want to do? You're a relatively young guy. You still have a lot of what What do you want to do? I mean, you're doing a lot. Obviously, you've got a movie going and a book and um, any larger plans. Those are fairly large, though. Um, I want to be happy, and simple things make me happy. But what I've really enjoyed was when I started these tours, and then it. It, it branched out into public speaking, motivational speaking. Yeah. And I've learned that it's the family story that I'm promoting with the mob in the background. And I just, it's been growing up to when this pandemic and everything started. I mean, I was going like crazy and I really enjoy that. Good. Um, I was doing some volunteer work for people that are getting out, you know, and it's, it's very ironic because before I go, he's a rat. Then when I'm done, they're like, oh, you know, he's a pretty stand-up guy. Wow, that's a hell of a story. And I've changed some people's lives. And, and, and to me, there's nothing more fulfilling than that. I'm not going to sit and preach. I'm just going to tell you my story. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully you, you, maybe you'll find something to change your life for the better. Yeah. So that's what I enjoy. I really enjoy that. When I'm not, I, I enjoy, oh, I work at the hotel. I've been here for over 10 years off and on. It's like uh -huh. Um, and, um, you know, they love having me around because I do anything, everything. Frank, do you have handy your, uh, where, how would one book you for a talk? Um, just, uh, right now it's just getting, uh, uh, a hold of me through, um, through my, uh, family secret tours .com. Or, or could they write to the Facebook page as well or no? Yeah. Yeah. You can write to the Facebook page. Um, uh, I, I prefer people getting a hold of me through um, uh, through my number through the Family Secrets tours because um, because I answer that. I mean, Facebook sometimes it goes crazy. Yeah. I mean, can this, I mean, I didn't. I, I think I didn't get back to you right away. Um, yeah. I, I'm really almost done with Facebook to some point sometimes because it's just. It's, yeah. 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 Phone number, by the way. Do you happen to know it up top? I can look it up if you don't. Yeah, I can look it up because it's. I don't give my personal number, but it goes to my personal phone. So yeah. if you call the um, tours. It's Let me look up. I'll go to the website. Yeah, hold on a second. Yeah, and let's give folks the opportunity. We'll give it a few times and make a, uh, not for the tours, rather, but for the speaking engagements. Well, yeah, I, I do a lot of uh, senior groups, a lot of libraries, um, uh, corporate events. You know, and I could take my story and I have like, you know, 10 different presentations and I can, I can actually put it more geared towards what the event is going on. You know, yeah, yeah. a lot of women, sometimes I have a lot right. of guys and, and do you know, the, the biggest readers of my book are women. Yeah. And when you believe it. you come to the book, you're like, well, you know, women be like, I'm not going to read this. Then they read it like, more yeah. and they're like, oh my God, this is a family story. They can actually relate to it. Yeah. yeah, that's what right. your story is. Your story isn't shoot them up. It's a story about yeah. the other and the son. Exactly, I, and that's, that's what affects people. You got it? You ready? Yeah, if you're a mob, 
tomorrow, my book is not the book that you're going to. Yes, that's it. Thank no, you. No, you're right. Two six one four four three. I'm going to read it out loud. So if you yeah, you read it out. Yeah, but I just want it up on the screen. So it's uh, eight four seven two six one four four three five. Yeah. So at eight four seven two six one four four three five, you can reach Frank. Uh, we'll Frank, I'm sure we, uh, you can get in touch with him and find out more about the. We'll put it in the uh, description below this uh, below this video. Also, yeah. It'll, I, I, I answer the emails, and uh, it's a one man show, so you're going to get me. That's all. It, it, it's a it's a hell. Like I said, I've I've taken the tour. I took it twice. I took a, a get uh, two guests at different times. Really a, a great show. Frank really really gives you it all. I mean, he's it, it, as we've seen today. He's really a great speaker, and uh, you really, yeah. I, I really want, get uh, what you see. Uh, we missed a brother. You you said there's three. I didn't know that. Who who's the other? Yeah, Nikki's eleven years younger than me. He's my youngest brother. He never got involved in anything. Oh, okay. Where do you go on the tour, Frank? On the tour? Yeah, where do you go? I mean, we get in. I'll, a I'll take you through. Um, I start out, we'll go over to Holy Name Cathedral. I talk about some of the history in you know, Al Capone. I go over by uh, St. Valentine's Massacre. But then I take you to the Grand, Grand and Ogden. I take you where my dad grew up. You know, so I go through the patch. Then I go to, uh, I go down Taylor Street, show you some history on Taylor Street, Little Italy. Then I take you through Chinatown. Uh, I take you through, I'll show you different sites there. Take you by Sox Park where one of the murders happened. Um, then I come back down through the loop. I go through the Rush Street area, Old Town. So I, I give you a little history of Chicago too. So I hit a few buildings off the mm -hmm. architectural tour. Um, yeah. I'm working out something with Harry Carey's right now, all the, all the history they have in their um, building. Um, I actually do a lot of big private tours. So they'll do the luncheon after and I'll go to the luncheon and we'll, you know, I'll sit around and talk with people. And then they open up the doors to show you the speakeasy in there. You go downstairs and see the history. There's, there's just such a wealth, and, and I've just been yeah. growing with it more and more. You know, when you come on a tour, it's not just about, hey, John Doe got shot over there and this guy no. shot. I'm talking about the different ethnic areas. I'm talking about food. I recommend restaurants, um, places to go, architectural buildings, a little as, bit about history. As somebody not from Chicago, you know, I've lived here for 12 years, but, you know, not from here, it really it really blew me away learning about the and, – and just – Watching somebody from Chicago drive who just knows everywhere with, you know, just like the back of their hand, just weaving th through the neighborhoods and all. I mean, it, it was really a great tour to just to learn about the city. And, and the mob stuff is secondary, but like, like Frank said, it's, it's the history, it's the architecture, it's the good places to eat. It was really a great all-encompassing tour just to learn about the city itself. You said Harry Carey. Is that Harry Carey's steakhouse or different? Oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 well, the, the main one is on Dearborn and... Um... Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, here, was it? Um, oh man, it's right up by the river, right there. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the main building. There's a lot of history in that building. Paul Rico owned that building at one time with Frank Nitti. I didn't know that. Yeah, and he used to part of it. The building next door, they had they had a warehouse there for the bootlegging and everything. They they have a lot of memorabilia in there that they found. Oh man. Yeah, I, I did a show on uh, CNN International. It's a travel show. And I took them around and took them in there. And uh, we, I took them to a lot of the historical stuff. And um, it was great. I mean, it was more of, about, you know, so you see my part with it and all these other people with the city and these other tours and stuff. It was pretty cool. So I stay in the hotel, or I did many times, next, well, kind of next to Harry, the baseball guy, right? Harry Carey. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, and I stayed. I didn't know that you could go in. I didn't know that. I thought it was just he was very close friends with my uncle Ed Hanley. Well, they, well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, he was. He was uh, good. And um, you know, Frank, the Holy Name Cathedral. Yeah. Well, across the street, most people don't realize that oh, guys, that was where O'Banion's flower shop was. Just a little. Right. And that's where he did. You know, he was killed. And, well, John, one of the things I do on the tours, because everything's changed, is I found pictures. So while I'm talking to you and we're in front of Holy Name, I pull up the picture showing right. the Union Flower Shop. I show you different angles. I show you right. not only the bullet holes in the wall now that's mostly covered, but I show you a picture the day after it happens. So, yeah, so I take you in areas, and I, I have the pictures. In the meantime, I'm showing you pictures of stuff from mine. Because people like to visualize too. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a, yeah. He's got the media right there. It's not just a you know. It's not just driving around and pointing. He's got the there's the media right there and, and you know with the with the uh, period pictures. 
It can make. And I learned all that myself with PowerPoint and keynotes, and and, yeah. and I've been learning. I wanted to know how to do it, so I would go take the free classes at Apple, and that's how I learned to do all this stuff. So I put my whole PowerPoint. I made my website. You know, so I'm learning. Yeah, I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm trying to learn. You want to say it right now, Frank? You you're giving me hope. <laughs> <laughs> Doing okay though, uh, Cam. You're doing good. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, Chicken McFadden was a bad guy who worked for Roger Tui, and his son was a detective. And many years ago, I drove around, and he said, "There's the cathedral." And uh, he said, "There were more bullet holes till goddamn vandals patched them up." <laughs> Only in Chicago would they see vandals patching up bullet holes. And my one restaurant that I used to own is right around the corner over there, Bellaluna. That's right, Bella Luna. I think you passed La Luce that I used to own too, and, and part of the story. So yeah, it's uh, but. Um, Are you a cook? Right. Yeah. yeah, I like to cook. Yeah. yeah, but I'm mostly. I grew up making pizza. I love pizza. So I grew up at a, a place in Elmwood Park called Armand's. You see it a lot where they talk where DeFranco and Saron and all those guys. It was a block away from my house. I started working there when I was 14. Is I that Dean Armand's? Right, they um, said that was the last thing Jackie Cerrone wanted. To say. For, as soon as he got out of prison, right before he died, he wanted to eat our moms. Yeah, and I can tell you tons of stories of stuff there, you know, and, and guys and is, things. And it's, it's, you know. Is that the chain? Because we have an Armand's in it's, it's it's a uh, It's a small chain now in the Chicagoland area, but it's not out of Chicago. No. Oh, okay. Well, what they did was they were franchising, but they bought a lot of them back because, um, you know, you can give, I can give you all the ingredients, but if, if somebody's not going to show you how to make it in every little thing, you know, it's, there's a lot more to it than, you know. Here made uh, Armand Chicago style pizza, which is this thick, uh, well, you know it. Then. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in all the Italian neighborhoods, we eat the thin crust. Okay, yeah. but Armin's is a deep, there's a the deep dish, which is, is big downtown, but we used to have the raised Sicilian is what it is with the, the, the toppings. You gotta have a good dough to have that. Yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah. I have made uh, 25 pizzas through a while. It, it's just, uh, and all the money I bought the brown thing you're supposed to, uh, you know what it is, you gotta have an oven first yeah. that can cook at high temperature. Uh, yeah, and no, John. If you get the pizza stone, you put it all the way on the bottom, you preheat that oven for 30 minutes at 500 degrees, that pizza stone will be good. Put a little cornmeal on the bottom so the pizza slides on and off, yeah. and it cooks yep. close. It's the closest thing without buying a pizza. You know, Pepe's Pizza, I don't know if you've ever heard of it in New Haven. I've heard of it, yeah, I haven't had it though. He says they invented, they brought the pizza in there. That's their trademark, is the corn on the bottom, and it does make it's really delicious. Yeah. 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 I'm a pizza holic, so. Yeah. Was, uh... <laughs> for 12 bucks, I just buy it and sit around and curse myself out for burning another one's uh, 12, 15 bucks. You know, bear in mind, I'm in West Virginia. First, the first yeah. time we had ever had Lou Malnati's was when we went to your uh, your tour, Frank, and we left and you had people right after. I was like, damn, if, uh, if you didn't have people, we would have had you come over to uh, Lou Malnati's with us. Yeah, I would have loved to. Yeah, that's the only downfall from the tour. I meet a lot of great people. They invite me out. And if they don't do it prior, if they do it prior, I'll put them on the last tour. But if yeah. they don't do it prior, I, you know, I'm a workaholic. I take an hour, hour and a half between each tour. My tours run over half the time. And, uh, you know, I, I just get in this role. Yeah, we, we didn't even think of it. We just we thought, oh, yeah, let's, shit, let's go get pizza. We're downtown, you know. <laughs> Uh, next time you guys are in Chicago, there's a place called Armand's Victory Tap. Um, it's on South Michigan Avenue. It's the um, it's the original Armand's recipe with the pizza. It's really good. And then Victory Italia is right down the street on Ontario, um, just um, uh, uh, past Orleans. And that's the original Armand's too. So oh. pizza, the thin crust pizza, and the stuffed artichoke and the baked clams is what I highly recommend. Yeah, we already plotted this out. We got a crew. We're going to talk to you about renting a bus. We got enough people. You know, the, that would be a great Once I'm back, that's what I do. You know, if, if, yeah. if you guys want to rent the bus, you want me to rent the bus, I, I work all that out. But um, 
I'm doing more and more private tours because I enjoy that. Um, and people, people seem to enjoy it too. And a lot of, what do you do in Chinatown? You you give a tour there too? What I mean, or you just go through Chinatown? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm taking you. No, we're going through Chinatown. I'll take you past a few clubs. You know, I show you stuff. Sometimes I get lucky. All the guys are sitting outside. It looks like a scene on The Sopranos or something. Um, yeah. But uh, um, yeah, I take you through. I just give you a little idea of the area. I take you past Angelo's house, and um, that's the only house I go through. And but yeah. I don't I don't take to anybody else's house. Um, and I take you where my dad grew up, uh, 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 on Grand Avenue. Um, what's, left of, uh, what's left of the patch? Not much. It's a lot of areas are gentrified. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It, um, uh, Chinatown is probably, Bridgeport Chinatown is probably the last ethnic area where there's still a lot of people in there. And you'll get that feel when we go in there, you know. But most of the other areas, it's just prime real estate. People have moved yeah. out. You know, me growing up on Harlem Avenue in the 80s and 90s, that was the new Little Italy. That's where everybody, when they got off the boat, were going. There's a couple bakeries on, on Taylor Street still, but in, in like new Italian restaurants, but there's not the old places anymore. People no, have built probably. new places on Taylor Street. I think Cabano's is one of the last ones now because they're all moving out. And, uh, uh, you uh, do, uh, can't afford it anymore down there. I say the Levy, you say the Levy, 22nd Street, right? Cam, uh, Levy, what had been the Levy? Uh, 20 long, um, 22nd Street, that's uh, yeah. Cermak. Cermak yeah. is 22nd Street. 26th uh, 26th Street, 33rd Street is uh, Chinatown. Yeah. So, uh, Sox Park is on 35th. Yeah. But running down with the, that was, uh, what is that? Is that 26th where the, le where the Levy is? Um, the wall is, I can't, I think that's 20, I can't remember. 22nd Street, which is now Cermak? Yeah, 22nd yeah, Street. Cermak. It's always been Cermak, 22nd Street. Yeah. Oh. They don't, they don't, this is, Chicago's not like New York, you don't call street, you know, it's not street numbers. It's, uh, you know, and you don't call the interstate numbers either. It's the Dan Ryan, it's the, uh, the Eads. Eden's, yeah, and Ryan. Yeah, Eden's and, uh, yeah. Eden's Sorry, Eads is the elementary school down the street. Uh, All right, gentlemen. Eisenhower. Yeah. To the uh, what town was that, Paul? That were, I told you, Sam Giancana lived there, and Arcota. Oak Park. Oak Park. Yeah, that's River Forest. Of, yeah, that's like a who's who. Of. Yeah, so they all border. You got um, Galewood, um, uh, Oak Park, River Forest, and um, and Elmwood Park. That's yeah, yeah. And then you got Paul Rico's old house with the elevator in there. Um, uh, yeah, you got a lot of guys there. Cardo's houses. Uh, yeah, a lot of them moved out there. In fact, you know, for many years there was there was a law that you um, that you couldn't rob in Elmwood Park or in those areas. You know, and if you did you get hurt? You know, yeah. But oh, it's because they're concerned about the neighborhood. Not always. That was concerned about the heat that would bring to them. Yeah. As a kid, did you know any of these guys? Or Carter, Rika? Rika, I think, was dead before your... Rika, Rika, yeah. All I knew was about Rika. We walked past his house one day when me and my dad were walking, and, you know, he had just said, that guy right there was the guy. Uh -huh. was he was the guy. You hear about the phone all the time, but this guy right here. Ricardo, I, I would be at weddings or something like that, you know. But if you're not introduced to somebody, you don't, you don't just walk up and say... Hi, you know, and um, so yeah, I was around them all. Um, Sam Giancana, I grew up with his grandkids, so oh. um, you know, so I knew his, his daughter Antoinette, but I grew up with the grandkids. Um, but I never met him. You know, I have been in, he's still around someplace in Chicago. Yeah. Um, in fact, when we were, I think it was when we were in prison, the nephew Sam Giancana, the nephew, wrote a book about his uncle. And my dad said that book, whoever fed him that information, it was spot on. And I don't remember the name of the book, but um, it's Double that, Cross. John, is that it? Is that no Double Cross? Double Cross. Double That's cross. But it's it's um, it's written by the nephew, and it's it's you know, guys in the life were talking about it. That there was stuff in there that was you know it, spot on. Is it Double Cross, uh, Kim? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right, Paul. That's it. Double cross. Yep. Double cross. Sam and Chuck G and Connor wrote that. I completely blew that off, Paul. I didn't. Even, I read a page or two. Really, I just thought it was this guy making stuff up. No, uh, you know, 
Guys in the Life were talking about that book. They were talking about that book, and years prior they were talking about a book that's hard to find, and oh my God. Um, the Don by William Brashler. Yes, oh. The Don. Yeah. All those books by Brashler are, are, are pretty... Uh, oh, the Don. Is Don Henry on. I think it's and Don Henry on. The 70s when everything was changing. Um, oh God, if I say it, it's hard to find, but my dad loved that book. He thought that, oh, God. Yeah, you got to think of the name of that now. That's it. I mean, you can't leave us here. Yeah, it was, it's, it's, it's a real weird name. It doesn't sound like a mob book. Is it the Chicago way? No, no. Uh, um, oh, man, I have to. I have to uh, oh, uh, Captive City? Yes. Yeah, Captive uh, City's the book, isn't it? Good. Yeah. Ovid Damaris. Yeah. Ovid Damaris. Yeah. Yeah, Damaris put out some good stuff. Yes. Captive City, there you go. Yeah. Yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, the Romer books, you know, was always, um, you know, hit and miss with that <laughs> stuff. You'd read it and you'd just be like, oh boy, this guy's really full of himself, you know. And yeah, that's what I heard. Also, yeah. I'm close to, um, I lived in D.C. for many years and other agents didn't like him. He was, uh, he had a bad reputation. He was a bully from what, this is what they tell me. Yeah, he was a physical, I guess he was a big guy, but he tended to be a bully and uh, challenging people to fights. He had been a heavyweight boxer or something. And uh, He was always very kind to me. I I, I always liked him, and he always took the time to talk to me. And they were very interesting. I just, there was a lot of parts that were way off, you know. And, yeah. it's, it's what and you he, intimidated him, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> what he knew at the time is what I'm guessing, you know, because right. he you're going to write about what you knew. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, the one part that really, really I knew when he was off, and I think a lot of people did, is when he kept saying he was the Tony's name, Tony the Ant. The Ant, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the neighborhood with the slang, hey, Ant, what's going on? You know, it's a short for Anthony, okay? And so yeah, yeah. I don't know where he came up with that, but that's what turned a lot of people off. And then when I read The War of the Godfathers, now people say that it was written as a uh, – a fiction book. I, I didn't know that, but I read that, and it was just so, so far fetched and off that, um, you know, it, it, that's what kind of turned me off on some stuff. Not his best work. No. So, no. Okay, so you agree with me there, Paul? Yeah, that that was a that was a rough one. But I mean, there was a lot of interesting reading that I read from him, and um, it was it was to me. I'm looking at somebody that that lived at a certain time that was, you know, law enforcement's view of it. Yeah. But what I really intrigued me was I just, the game that him and Ricardo were playing back and forth, you know. And yes. Uh -huh. The ant, it never, it never, and it's so simple. It never occurred to me. The ant, of course, Anthony. Yeah, Anthony. So, yeah, Anthony, there you go, yeah. So yeah, Anthony, that's say, what they Everybody's put. just short names, you know, so you don't say yeah. Anthony, you say, hey, ant, what's up, you know. You, so, yeah. Ant, Knows Falacho personally, or no. I, I met him a handful of times, and we're like I said, where our families were very close. You know, yeah, uh, we were in hoagies all the time. Michael and my dad were close. Uh, you know, my dad and Tony, like I says, they had their differences at times, but they had a mutual respect for one another for yeah. many years. And that was the hardest part about when they were getting killed was, you know, go going back to the family part. I mean, these guys are our friends. Yeah. You know, and, and they're getting killed. You know, it's just, it's like you can be one minute, you're fine, and the next minute, and then the criminal justification, kill Michael so you can get Anthony. I had many, many long, wonderful conversations. I don't know if you know the guy. His name was Joe Pignatella, Joe Pigs, but he was in Las Vegas, and he ran the Suvios, uh, and he was in a partnership with uh, Spilatro. And well, I, I don't know who that is. I heard the name before, but I don't, I don't know who he is. He was a great guy. And yeah. you, he gave you a whole different perspective of Spalacho you saw in the movies. You know, he 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 loved the guy. And uh, a whole he different... A very, you know, yeah, exactly. The movie makes him look out to be like this loose cannon. There's a lot more to it. And you know the funny part about it is, out of all the Spalacho brothers, Dr. Pat Spalacho was the toughest one. He's a dentist. Yeah. Um, yeah. Incredible. Heard the same thing. Yeah, Frank, uh, talking about ain't me, ain't the ants. Uh, there's a story 
and I don't know if you've heard this, but the story was that one of the reasons he got knocked down was he had aspirations to take over the mob. Mm -hmm. And there's a story that he actually went to see a Cardo in Palm Springs to make his case. Did you ever hear that? No, no, I didn't. I mean, it could have happened, but I didn't. I just know that he was, he was moving up fast. He was moving up very fast. And there's a reason why he's moving up very fast. Okay. You know, because of, he, he proved that, you know, you don't move up fast in the Chicago map. Yeah. He was moving I, also, up fast. I read some stuff from the time, some news articles and some, some reports from the time. And he had just had several serious heart attacks and he had put on a lot of weight. Mm. And I, I think he had just, written a new will because he was he what he just had a quadruple bypass shortly before he not long before he he was he was killed i mean i think he wasn't expecting to live long on his own you see how much weight he's put on from when he was young to when they got him when he had his mustache and i mean he he had chunked up a bit but he just had quadruple bypass i think shortly before uh oh, shortly before and everything he was looking at you know he knew he fell out of favor yeah well, and so all that stress too, uh, yeah. That, yeah, right. And, and it gets you. And then you got the government all over you all day long. Yeah, you know. But again, the Spalatro family—they're torn apart right now too. Okay. Terrible. So talking yeah. about Romer and Spalatro, Romer's <laughs> book, yeah. which mine happens to be autographed. Yeah. <laughs> not a bad book. No, I read that. I, I enjoyed that book. The War of the Godfathers was one that threw me off. I, I agree with you, Frank. I didn't like it. Yeah. But, and here's Double Cross, the one that you mentioned that your father yeah. was so impressed with. Did you read it? You bet. No, I wasn't. Did you, did you enjoy it or did you? I thought it was great reading. I just didn't know that I believed a lot of it. But saying that your father said it was really on, I'm going to read it again. Yeah. yeah, I got to read it again too. But I remember my dad telling me, and I did read it. And I just don't remember. You know, because one of the things I did in prison was I read as many books as I could. And a guy told me that was down for 10 years, he goes, write down what you read. He goes, because you're going to wind up reading books twice. I pick up a book a year later, I get a chapter in, say, oh, shit, I read this one already. So then I started writing them down. Yeah, yeah, that's happened to me as well. Same thing. Yeah. But uh, I, I thought Romer's Enforcer book was actually pretty good. Yeah, that, that, I like that one the best, to tell you the truth. I and like you talk about his interplay with Accardo and that game. And one of the stories he tells in Man Against the Mob is when he went to a cardo for Bernie Glickman, and it uh, interfered to, to try and save Glickman's life. Yeah. And I don't know if that's a true story or not, but what a great story of him and a cardo going walking down the street in the middle of the night in River Forest. Yeah. Well, that's what we did is walk. Now, and you're walking with two guys that don't trust one another, right? Okay. But I know the mentality. I don't know the mentality of the law enforcement because I haven't been there. But I know the mentality of these guys. Okay. And if we could do something for it, just like. Giancana tried to do, just like Lucky Luciano and Lansky tried to do in World War II. If we can give you something, then you're going to give us something back. We're not doing it out of the kindness of our heart. Yeah. So he, he, you know, he's trying to show, uh, he's trying to show Romer, hey, look, I'm human too. You know, I'm not going to admit that we're, you know, I'm not going to incriminate myself, but, you know, all of a sudden. So, yeah, it, it, and that's the stuff that intrigues me because it is, it's mind games. I would love to know what they were really trying to get out of it, both of them. I'm sure that'd yeah. be a story in itself. Yeah. I'm sure that it was Romer's hope to get some information out of Ricardo and maybe maybe even turn him in some way so he could use that information. But they had a mutual respect for each other, Yeah, uh, even though they were enemies. Which I go back to tell you what my dad taught me. Don't disrespect. Don't let them make it personal. See, Romer talks about how he kind of liked the Cardo, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So right. that's what the philosophy was. You know, um, a Cardo didn't get his kids involved. I remember right. when you first explained that about don't make it personal. It, it, that really made so much sense to me, Frank. I, I remember uh, when, you, you know, and, and it, it really is. Why would you be antagonistic? I mean, if you do that, then they're just going to be like, I'm going to nail this guy. I'm going to get this guy. So even, even you know, when I approach any situation, I try not to make it personal. It, it just makes so much sense. If you're going to approach a, an opponent, you know, anybody that you're against, I mean, don't, don't take them off. Just, it's just not going to help. They're not going to help you. Exactly. It's like a mind chess game. I mean, yeah. if you, once you make it personal, what I'm talking about is making personal is you sitting at the dinner table exactly. off the clock with your wife and kids. And you're so mad, all you're thinking about is getting me. Mm -hmm. 
right. you know, at some point, you can make all the mistakes you want. You're law enforcement. I can't make one. So you don't want to get to that. Yeah. The problem with a lot of families, as you know, the Seaforts, there are a lot of other examples. They take it personally because they don't know how else to take it. I mean, you've been in the field. You've been, you, you understand that don't take it personally. But, you know, some guy's son is ex-wife. And they, they, I don't think it's the same thing, is it? Well, it's, it's also a thing where, where it's, uh, well, I'm, that's, that's all, I, I'm talking about two guys uh, uh, in a conversation. Sorry at all. Where yeah. That's somebody's father getting killed. So it's, it's, it's easier to tell somebody don't take it personal or it's business. But, you know, when it happens to you, it's different. So yeah. conversations are different. But, uh, you know, yeah, it, it, it's hard for those kids to let go. Um, and they're not kids no more. They're men now. But, you know, they're mad at the mob. They're mad at their dad for, you know, even, you know, thinking about itself first. So, you know, um, it, it's, it's a great story because this man tried to give everything to Lombardo and move on and open up another place. They don't let you go. They yeah. see the money. They're not going to let yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we did a, uh, the three of us did a, 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 an interview with Frank Maritotti, right? Maritotti. Maritotti. His father, well, it was way before. His father was Frankie Diamond, who was a really bad guy. Yeah, yeah, I've read a lot about that. Yeah. They killed him in front of Frank, who was, the, uh, isn't he the gentlest, nicest man you could have? Yeah. What happened was he was sitting in the car, and one guy killed his father on the other side, and one guy reached in the car and shoved Frank's head down so he wouldn't get hit. Um, for years, he couldn't grow hair. On the, he's got a huge head of hair. He couldn't grow hair on the back of his head. And he saw a psychiatrist and he worked it through. But, you know, you talk about carrying it, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's just, yeah, what he probably went through, you know? Yeah, to have right yeah. up, you know? How long is your tour? Uh, I try to keep it under two hours. Wow. That's a long time. I, I've never had any complaints um, no. uh, uh, about the time of the tour. Usually, sometimes with some people, we'll be sitting in the car after for another half yeah. hour. They have a lot of questions. So it, it's, it's, I want you to, just like when you guys got a hold of me, Camilus, you took the you took the tour twice. You like, can yeah. we do the interview? Yes, I support the people that support me. Okay, I get these calls every day, but I'm going to support the people that support me. So when you come on my tour, I want to make sure that 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 you're really enjoying it. That's an experience. Yeah, yeah. I value the customer. It's kind of old time. I'm I'm not here to screw you. I, I want you to go out and tell everybody that you loved it. And if you didn't, tell me. If you hated it, I want to know. Yeah. What can I do? I don't want you upset. I want you to walk away from there and say, wow, that was great. Yeah, yeah. Put everything yeah. into it. Yeah. Do uh, You must be constantly busy, though, right, with the tour? I was. I was. I, it was it left up to um, – yeah. so I took a break in January and came out here for a couple of months and kind of vexed out by working at the hotel. I just needed a little break. I was doing three tours a day, almost seven days a week. Wow. And, I mean, it was all private. Private took off anywhere from one person to 40 people. Yeah. yeah private. So my thing is based on private now because it, it's great. It's, it, it, yeah. it, it's more um, financially uh, better for me yeah. you know, because I'm just a single guy. I can't order all these trucks and buses and hope they get full. Yeah. I, I can customize it more to the people. And so, I'm enjoying it. They're enjoying it. Let me ask you, what's the payment? Cash? Credit card? Oh, you can do credit. You can go right online. I set it up. You go right mm -hmm. online and you can use your credit card. I have all the secure stuff. I use Square and everything. And um, and you make the appointment. And, um, you know, uh, I, I don't really deal in cash. Uh, it's just credit cards. You so know, you, and, uh, you would go to Family Secret Tours. It's Family Secrets Tours. Family I, yeah, so um, I charge, 
I knew Frank Collada was charging uh, uh, like 100, 150 per person for private tours. He was the one that gave me the idea. He was recommending people or calling. So I took a few people, but it was few and far between. But I really enjoyed the private tour. I mean, you know, at first I was charging 100, 150 a person. And I was getting Yeah, I'm sure you were. Yeah. And then I'm I, sure you were. So I brought it down to $59, a minimum of two people. And uh, that has been going great. And everybody's like, oh, you've got to raise the money. You've got to raise the money. I said, look, I'm not here to gouge anybody. I says, when my time spots, when I, I'm full, that's when I might raise it a little bit. But in the bus, it's $39 a person. If I did the public bus tours. That was hard because people come late. I tell you to come 10 minutes before. And it, it was hard. It's hard. It's hard filling up those buses, a lot of advertisement. Do you know, I, my, I built my, my company off of TripAdvisor, Yelp, and Google. Yeah. And, um, and uh, I do very little advertising, and God, it took off. And, uh, yeah, that, and I put you on the uh, put you on the news a couple times, and that was uh, you know that was where I, I think I saw you on a uh, uh, news clip on YouTube, and that was uh, that was that. Yeah, I yeah, thought, same here. As soon as you're back online, I want to bring the wife in and, and and do the private tour. I have a feeling that all this COVID is going to go away early in November, but maybe I'm just suspicious. <laughs> I, I I hope you're right. <laughs> yeah, I really hope you're right because <laughs> I really want to get back to it. Right now, what I'm looking at is I'm thinking March. That's what I'm thinking, you know, and just waiting. You know, I started getting a lot of calls two weeks ago, a lot of calls about private tours. And then after Sunday and then this following Saturday, it's been nothing, nothing. And that I can't go back to Chicago and base on opening up a business and not knowing what's going to happen that weekend downtown in the whole area that I go through. So right. I have, to, I have to sit back and wait because I'm antsy. I want to get back to it. I enjoy it. Right. Well, when I was downtown with my wife the other day, it was it was practically deserted compared to what you usually see, guys, and and they're broken glass everywhere. Even the Ronald McDonald House was torn up. Yeah. Sure. And uh, you remember Central Camera that's down there, right in the loop, that old camera store that's been there for a hundred years. Yeah. Gone. A, a hole in the wall, just totally, totally destroyed. Yeah, a lot of businesses aren't going to reopen either, and it's a shame because there's just so much history and so much beauty in the city, and, and I hate to see yeah. it. You know, hopefully, hopefully, um, we can get back. You know, I just want to get back to work. I want to get back to work. I want to enjoy what I do. And um, you know, Frank, I have guys I know out there with a fraction of your knowledge and background, uh, policemen, historians who are guessing their way through. The city of Chicago, no, Cook County library system has a speakers. Do you know about that? You just go from one library. Yeah, I, I, I just started looking into all this stuff. Even out here, too, there's a huge network that I'm, that I'm working on. So I'm putting some stuff together right now so yeah. that I can start sending it out, emailing it to all these companies. I've been lucky because um, a lot of my, my work is to my, word, of my, word of mouth. So I, I do a presentation, and then I get five calls after that before the communities. I do almost every different community. Um, you know who's, uh, that uh, John A. Light's got a, uh, a podcast. He's got a decent following. Uh, yeah. John just started talking to him. On the phone. I talked to John on yeah. the phone the other day. I, was gonna say, he just, I just realized he had a big podcast. He, had a, he has a really good following, you know? He also, well, he's written, I think, three books. He also was in the, uh, on Netflix that that, that, um, that yeah. Book. Series that limited yeah, uh, John just uh, just talked to him on the phone recently. Got uh, talking. He's, he's, he's very uh, social media savvy. He really is. Did you interview him already? Huh? Did you guys interview him already? No, we were going to. I liked him a great deal. I thought he was a good guy. Because I, I I can contact him if you once you guys are ready, and I, I can make a connection. We're nice guys that we don't ask dirty questions and take cheap shots and. Uh, he's an Albanian guy. Did I tell you that? He's Albanian. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I also know some people that are very close to him too. And uh, yeah, he's uh, he has very interesting story. Very interesting story. I, we think what we're going to do, Frank, is uh, specialize in Chicago. Okay. Yeah, that, that's that's a great plan. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, do you guys know Kenji Gallo? 
No. I, yeah, I, 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 I don't know him. I know him from he was on Gary's show, and uh, you know, uh, Gangland Wire. So I was gonna, I was gonna see about getting his information because he tells a hell of a story. Yeah, yeah, and how he's changed his life around. So Kenji's a real close yes. friend of mine. He lives out in the suburbs. He opened up a, um, a martial arts school for training. He teaches. He volunteers a lot of times with Alzheimer, older people getting in shape. It's an MMA school. Uh, Kenny is half Italian, half Japanese. He's got he's a here, he's, he's here in in Chicago. Yeah, I did. I I thought he might be out in Los Angeles. No, he was in Los Angeles. He moved to Chicago. His wife is from Chicago, but they're out in the suburbs. Um, Kenji's very close with me. So if you guys, if you want. Just let me know when you're ready, and I'll have him contact you. Um, Thank you, uh, Frank. He's got a hell of a story like mine. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Frank. Frank. We would like that. We would yes, really absolutely. like that. Thank you, you very much. And so, um, I'll try to think anybody in Chicago that's interested in um, in talking. Um, I I just have to think. You know, uh, who else? Then also, it's always because me and me and Kenji, along with a guy named. Uh, um, uh, Andrew D. Donato from the Gambino family. Andrew Donato's was, got a hell of a good story too. Yeah, so the three of us were doing some speaking uh, engagements and we did one in Vegas. We did a couple in Vegas. So we did it with the Clark County Library. They have a huge auditorium. It was like 300 people. So they wanted me to talk. I said, well, I'm going to bring Andrew and Kenji. They said, well, they already talked. I said, okay. I said, but what I want to do here is I wanted to try something different. So on the screen behind us, I just put a continuous, because it was a huge screen, continuous slides of, you know, New York, Chicago, Vegas, and all that. And we had three stools, and we sat out there. And we talked about the East Coast, Chicago, West Coast. We talked about how we operated, how, yeah. we, you know. And that, that's we great. everybody away. They were just loved. Uh, we were, brought them on Man Cow, because I was on Man Cow a couple times. I brought them on Man Cow, and we were just starting to get into it. And... Um, Tom Dreesen was coming on. Well, I know Tom. My uncle made his career, my uncle Ed. Anyways, Tom, like a little bitch, okay, and I hope it's still being recorded because I was so, <laughs> says, I'm not going in there with, with, with rats. Oh. Oh. And he hid in the other room till we left. And I wanted to go confront him and said, it's all right when you see me in Gibson's that you come over and kiss my ass, but now you're going to make a statement. <laughs> and then you get mad because everybody asks you about Frank Sinatra. You know, it, it just upset me that he had to do that because he could have came on. I'm not going to out you. I'm not going to disrespect you in any way, but we could have had a nice conversation. And if you don't like rats, you could have said that. Nobody's going to hold it against you. Okay. So that, that really upset me, but... Me yeah. and I was loving it with the three of us and, on the show. You know, I, yeah, I would, you know, I, I would like to, I think even focusing on Chicago, when we could get decent guys, I, I mean, it, it certainly wouldn't hurt to have a guy like Di Donato on who tells a he great lives, story. He lives in Chicago, and, too. He lives in Chicago, yeah. too. He lives in Chicago, too? Yeah. No shit. Wow. Uh, you know, Kenji and Di Donato, I've, I've heard both of them I've seen both of them speak. They both tell incredible stories about things that they've done. So yeah, I, I think that we, we would we could really benefit from have both of them. They're both part of that support group that I tell you about. You know that we talk. You know each other off the ledge. We've done speaking events together. We we almost had a contract with a show like My Blue Heaven in Arizona. We filmed it. The networks were going to take it, and the people that spliced it were from England. <laughs> yeah. All up. yeah, yeah, right over their heads. I know. You know us coming together in Scottsdale, and we're going to open up a, a restaurant, and we're going to work it. Yeah. Now we changed our lives. Um, uh, oh, I forgot what the title was, and they they changed it to Knife by something or something. But we had all these networks that were ready to take it. The Food Network wanted it too. They didn't want to give it to the Food Network because the studio we we're working for doesn't make money off the Food Network. We make all the money. Oh, it was hilarious. Did so, you stop it? Pardon me? Why, why don't you pursue it? We did for a bit. We had some other people try to pursue it. There's always a, a window that opens and closes in Hollywood. It's very hard to get something done. So you just got to keep pushing and yeah, pushing. This, 
I know, I know. Right, these these kids nowadays, like you know, like my niece that I brought, you might not remember, but I brought her on the tour with us, and she's you know she's young, she's just Gen Z. Like I've been telling, like they're all about this this you know this stuff that to them is not a re you know this this mob stuff and all like the idea of it, and I don't mean that's all, but but just anything that they can do, it's it's going to be big. It's like you know what. You know, it's you see this new thing on Netflix and all. I think that anything to do with that is going to be, you know, the next next thing. And I think the kids are going to really be into it. So I think that something like that's got a huge potential. Yeah. You know, well, you know. Point, Cam. That it's all new to them. Exactly. That's it's all new to this new generation, the Frank. The more this is over, the more people are intrigued with it. And so, and these kids don't know about it. Yeah. So, right. Donald Light has had had an idea, and he's getting it done, and that's why he called me, and I says, yeah, I'm on board. I don't want to talk about his idea because it's his idea to talk about, but yeah. he's got some good people behind him, and it's uh, it's something like I was talking about, this roundtable, stuff like that, and uh, he's just brought it to another level. So um, I'm waiting to hear back from him because I'm very interested in it, and yeah. I, think, I think his I idea is... I hope it. I hope it works out, Frank. You really, really deserve something good like that. I mean, you're, I, 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 you know, since I've lived out here, one thing I've really come to respect and really like about Chicago is just y'all know how to hustle. And I, I mean, it's it's just something I really, you know, something about people of Chicago. Y'all know how to hustle. Y'all know how to make it happen, and y'all always do. So, you know, Frank, I have books that I wrote 25 years ago, every month, and I still make a little bit of money, not a fortune, but. They were years ago, and now I can tell there are people. But you know, Capone is popular in Japan. It's amazing. This is a worldwide thing. You know, um, I, I get a lot of people from all over the world, and uh, it's been great. You know, um, I've met a lot. I have, I've built a lot of friendships. I've been offered jobs. I've been offered to come and visit and stay. Um, you know, and uh, it's, it's have you spoken at the uh, Mob Museum in Las Vegas? I spoke there. They just put up on their site my uh, interview. My, my uh, interview. Yeah. Just put up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Is I, there there anybody, the Mob Museum in Chicago? There was a guy that was talking about it's hard to, to raise. It. So you left that. But now the Mob Museum I did I did with Mike Mesa, the FBI agent in the case. I've spoke with Mike before, and the people love it because it's a dynamic of when we're both speaking, so Mike will tell the FBI side, I'll tell my side, then me and Mike start talking about our relationship and everything we went through together, serious yeah. stuff, funny stuff, and um, and, and, and it's, it's, it's well received. It's I, well I bet y'all have a good dynamic between the two, you coming at it from, from those two different angles. Yeah, and we have a lot of fun. And Mike was another guy in the case. It's funny because in the book I talk about it, Mike is very young looking. And when Mike came on, he came right out of the academy. And they sent him out to the prison. And I looked at him when he sat down and I talked about this. I go, they're sending kids out here now? You know, they are taking me serious. Mike was unbelievable. Smart. And between him and Mitch Marge, it was like having an all-star team. It was really cool. And, you know, we, we developed a great business relationship, me and Mike. You know, we butted heads at times. You know, it was all for the good of everything. So... He was the one that really got me started. He says, uh, uh, do you want to get up and speak in front of people? I go, what are you, nuts? He goes, well, we got the Department of Justice for the state of California, their big conference. They want us to come out. I go, I never spoke in front of anybody. I go, who wants to hear about a rat that told his father, you know, told on his father? I go, Frank, that's not your story. Mm -mm. So I sat down, and me and Mike, and that's how this all got started. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. Right. You don't have a podcast. Yeah, I, 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 YouTube, I, I refuse, I, I passed on that one guy on YouTube that was interviewing Sammy Bull and everybody, they called me, they were going to fly me out, I forgot. Um, Valuetainment, uh, Ben, yeah, David, Ben, uh, well, yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, so, I'll tell you what, uh, because you're, you're an, I like you a lot, and you're a good guy. Uh, Hell, me and Ken, Paul, we'll build your damn podcast for you, we'll show you how to do it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I appreciate that offer. I just, right now, I'm trying, so what I'm trying to do is, is just focus on a couple of things and grow slow. I know it sounds crazy, but there's, I'm, I'm getting hit with so much stuff that I'm trying to, um, I guess I'm trying to grow slow. I, I want to get it right. I want it, and um, so I've, I've had people, friends of mine, 
that, um, uh, you know, I started a YouTube page and I'm not keeping up on it. It's just, I just don't have enough time sometime with everything. Yeah. So I'm concentrating right now on getting this movie project done. Yeah. That's yeah. the door for me. And then taking one step at a time. I love the motivational speaking, the public speaking, and I want to get this movie project done. And then I want to slowly move to a YouTube channel or a podcast. And once I can do that, but right now, in order for me to survive, I also have to work. So yeah. it's it, yeah. 60 <laughs> with MS. So sometimes it's just, but I, I, I appreciate, I appreciate that offer. And I may take you up on it at some point. Well, I, I speak for Kim and Paul. You need it, man. Yeah. We'll yeah, well, yeah. What, what, what I usually try and do is, is I let my sort of partial mania take over, and I try and do everything at once, and then I do it all sort of sloppily. Uh, yeah. But I think that your approach is probably the best. Is uh... <laughs> well, it, it works different for everybody? I'm just trying to do what I'm comfortable with. I, I yeah, I think you're exactly right. You know, I first well, you know one thing that Frank, that, that there's no way to ask you all the questions we have. Even oh in God. two or three yeah. hours, and I, yeah, I would. would really, really be excited if you would come back again sometime because yes. I've got a list of things. You know, we we went uh, uh, down a couple of alleys that are fascinating, and there's another dozen of them. Yeah, that we can go down. We need to wrap. I didn't realize the time. We need to wrap it up. Not only that, he should come back because I have a better suit coat than this that I want to show you guys. No sweatsuit yet. Huh? <laughs> no pants either. A hubcap on a chain, you know. <laughs> that's right. I have, I have beautiful suit coats, so you know that's really. I mean, you're important too. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wear my. I'm gonna. I, I mean, I got my Puma. Uh, I got my Puma leisure suit. That's what I'm gonna wear next time. There you go. Oh. Nice. Oh, maybe your wife will come on with it. You know, Kim. Kim. I'm telling you, she's real. I'm, she's on. She's she's at. Uh, she's out at the store right now. I'm telling you, she's real. You guys, just, you guys just told me something. Do you know who you want to talk to? And oh, I, no. Not my ex-wife. Who? My ex-wife. <laughs> yeah? You guys yeah. want to talk to her, I'll set it up. She'll do it, okay? I'd love to. I, I think that Absolutely. Be She's helping yes. us in the new book, okay? Because yeah. her story is the one in every visit. I brought her to a speaking engagement. I said, I want you to get up and speak and just tell your story. Yeah. Right? in front of anybody go Lisa people want to hear your story so yes I spoke for a little bit I had her get up there and speak from the heart at the end everybody was in line to talk to her she goes you were right I don't know why I listened to her I go you have an unbelievable story uh -huh. she's good at telling it too if you watch my nightline you'll see her speak for a couple of minutes but if you guys want something different yes yes it's a woman's point of view that was in yes. this uh, when can you talk to her when yeah. you want to do it. She's, uh, the evenings are the best for her, like 4 or 5 o'clock. Okay. You want to give me, uh, you know, give me a, some dates. And, uh, or if you want me, let me get a hold of her, and she could give you some dates. Yeah. Yeah. You got my, uh, you got my uh, email, right, Frank? You know, let me, I'll get a hold of her when I get off the phone, and I'll set something up in the next week or so. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what we're trying to go for on this is – not the usual. Then I shot him, and then hey, yeah, I want to. What happened to the wife? What happened to the child? And we're respectful. I think I would never yeah. blind. She, you guys will like her. She's she's educated. She she doesn't. She's not like you. So well, you know, I told my dad. You know, you should kill that motherfucker. You know, no. <laughs> <laughs> Gloria Gotti had a real good story, but she was acting too much like a gangster, and she lost all the female. Uh, yeah. yeah. Right. But she did have a good story. If you listen to her sister, by the way, you know yeah. what genre is uh, Banano's wife, Rosalie. Do you remember? Yes, she just came out with a book, Rosalie Banano. Very good too. And she's, a, you know, she's a class act. Bill so, Banano's wife. Wife actually helped write a whole chapter in the book describing my father and describing the whole family structure. And these uh, guys wrote the book with me that wrote eighteen other books. Um, uh, the Zimmerman brothers. They just loved Lisa. And in this new book, a lot of it is going to be with her telling the story. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, that's, she, yeah, she's, that's, that's, yeah, that's absolutely. It just I'd love that. to have her on. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I'll set that up. She's going to come on. Okay, I, I will, I will get that done. Um, and then you uh, over here and I'll feed you meatballs and spaghetti and sausage. And, I can vouch for those. They're excellent. Oh, he's a great cook. There you go. There you go. And my breakfasts are to die for. Uh
No? Oh, yes. Yeah. I good, though? Yeah. Uh, Frank, I think we'd uh, we definitely like to have you on, and uh, I'll reach out. I'll reach out to you through the uh, the email now, and maybe we can. Uh, I, I would like to see about having uh, Andrew and, and Kenji on. I'll talk to uh, John and uh, Paul, give them uh, the heads up on the two of them, because I, like I said, I, I think I, they both I, got great stories. Yeah, Kenji for sure. I'll get on. Uh, Andrew, I haven't talked to recently, so I gotta I gotta I gotta hunt them down. Um, um, but um, I, I I know how to get a hold of them, so. You know. Let me give people. I yeah, I don't mean to put you in a spot if it's a if it's a weird spot reaching out to someone. I mean, I, I can. No, I can no it's not. I just haven't talked to him in a okay. while. Okay, yeah, I reach out to him because we reach out to each other once in a while. Before we uh, before we leave, I want to tell people one more time: what is the correct email or uh, address online for your tours? Uh, I, mean, I misspoke it. So it's Frank. It's um, familysecretstours.com, right? Hold on, let me, uh, let me. <laughs> I just want to, I want to pull it up. It's family secrets with an S, tours with an S dot com. Yeah, family secrets, and we'll put it in the description uh, at the bottom of the uh, YouTube video. You know what, that's true. So at the end of this, uh, uh, both programs, you can have a link directly to Amazon, uh, and we'll put it on our blog, and we'll put it on our, it's going to be in a lot of places. Uh, yeah. It'll take you directly to Amazon to buy Frank's book, Frank Calabrese to buy his book. Uh, I'll put the phone number up there as well so you can call and uh, book yourself and a brief bio of Frank and uh, a photo and so forth. The book is uh, here, Operation Family Secrets. It's, it's it's a mob book, but it's a it's a family story. It's a really great uh, is around. It in the corner? Huh? Frank, is that you in the corner? There's uh, the father and there's... Dad, I, I, that's a prison photo, me and my dad. There were other people in the photo. They just split it and they put the... Yeah. Wow. You were a kid. You were a baby. Look. I was 37 in that picture. Yeah. You guys want to laugh. Um, the, New York, uh, uh, the New York Times bestseller, number 14. You know how that happened? NPR calls me. Or the, uh, um, Random House calls me and they're like, hey, we... Uh, we got an interview with you on NPR, the Terry Gross show. I'm like, who the hell is Terry Gross and what's an NPR? <laughs> <laughs> on it twice, I shoot up. I passed uh, Sammy Hager by one spot. And, yeah. and that was it. <laughs> Those are the New York Times readers. NPR, the New York Times readers. You know? And Terry Gross, she'll sell you some books. I learned. Oh, yeah. I learned that, yes, yes, and that's how I hustle too. I sell my books, uh, you know, off after the tour, speaking engagements. My girl comes with me, and you know, it's uh, it's just a hustle. That's if it. If you can put us in touch with Terry Gross, we could use some new listeners. You know? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I want to try to keep in touch too. Um, <laughs> uh, hopefully, I get him again when. Um, Absolutely. When Here's I, to you. Uh, when I get the second book out, but I'm Here's to you, brother. I'm excited for you guys talking to Lisa. You're going to really enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. And she's I'm looking forward to it. You know, if she's not going to answer some, she'll tell you, but she's going to really open up, and it's very interesting, very interesting. And I'm going by what other people have told me. Well, Frank, thank you so much for coming on. It, it's been fantastic. You're going to come back, I hope? Sure. All right, good. That was really, did you hear that? Yeah, sure. That was really relaxing. She was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. come on. <laughs> and again, Paul, you're a good man. Thank you. I know you must be exhausted. Ten hour drive last night from DC to back, right? Oh, wow. But we had those delicious grinders to keep us fueled and awake. And you call them grinders. Good man. Good man. What well, that came from the East Coast. That's right. What do they call them in Chicago? Sub sandwiches. Sub well, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Gentlemen. Good night to you. Thanks. It was a pleasure meeting you guys, too. And, yes, I definitely will be back. So Frank, our pleasure. Thank you. Frank, I'm going to stop. Hold on. Huh?